Okay, so welcome to our final lecture on season four. This is going to be a short lecture, and unlike the last couple, it's not connected to a particular episode. I want to talk for this lecture about asexuality and the fact that Todd spends a bunch of this season um, coming to terms with and understanding his own asexual identity. I think this was a really interesting choice on the part of the makers of the show because asexuality is not an identity that we see represented very much in the media. And we watch Todd um, just first come to an awareness that maybe this is what he is and then slowly build it into a self-conscious and fully um, formed identity over the course of this season. Asexuality is a really interesting identity to understand. Um, I gave you a reading about asexuality for this season, and at one point, close to the beginning of that reading, the authors say, how do we begin to analyze and contextualize an, a sexuality that by its very definition undermines perhaps the most fundamental assumption about human sexuality, that all people experience or should experience sexual desire? And I think this is really challenging for us, right? We, I mean, we've spent a lot of time over the last several decades coming to terms with the idea that people's sexual orientation is a matter of their own personal desires and is not a matter for moral and medical evaluation. We've come to understand that whoever we happen to be sexually attracted to, whether that's people of our own gender or a different gender or multiple genders or whatever it may be, that our sexual orientation is not a matter of moral concern or medical concern. It's just a matter of how our particular constellation of desires happens to work. And I hope that by now in 2019, we're all pretty comfortable with that conclusion about sexual orientation. It used to be that um, some people treated um, same-sex orientations as a moral problem, as something that was um, morally wrong. We now understand that there's not really any argument for why it's morally wrong, but other people treated it as a kind of a medical problem, right? They, they thought that so-called homosexuals um, were ill and needed to be fixed somehow, that there was just something defective about them. And we've come to understand that that's a very damaging way of understanding sexual orientation, because sexual orientation isn't a matter of health or illness, it's just a matter of how our desires happen to work. But asexuality is different and challenging for a lot of us because no matter how much we accept the wide range of sexual orientations and the wide range of ways that people's desires work, we do still tend to assume that everybody is supposed to have some sexual desires and some sexual orientation, regardless of what that may be. And this is partly because we think of sexuality as a pretty fundamental human good and a pretty fundamental human pleasure, right? Those of us who are not asexual find, most of us at least, find sexuality extremely pleasurable and important to our flourishing. And so we presume that whatever form it takes in somebody else, you know, we can accept whatever form that is, but we, accept, we assume it will take some form or other. So as these authors point out, there's something challenging to us about how to accept the idea that somebody's sexual orientation might be the non-orientation, right? That they just aren't sexually attracted to anyone. And the authors point out that until very recently, to the extent that culturally we paid attention to asexuality at all, which wasn't very much, we mostly treated it like we used to treat other forms of sexual orientation as a medical issue, right? We pathologized it. In other words, we just presumed that people who had no sexual desire were in some way dysfunctional or deficient, and that if possible, medicine should figure out a way to fix them, to give their sexual desire back. And it's been an interesting shift to try to get used to the idea that for some people, I mean, look, don't get me wrong, there are people who, um, would like to have sexual desires and don't, right? And for whom medical solutions might be helpful, either um, psychiatric solutions or physical solutions that might be um, giving them barriers to having a fulfilling sex life that they want to have. But there are other, so I'm not knocking medical interventions for such people, but there are other people who don't have sexual desires and don't feel broken or deficient and don't especially want to be fixed, as it were. And they don't want their own particular 
desire constellation, which doesn't include sex, to be treated as a symptom of physical breakdown or mental illness. Because ultimately, if you don't feel broken, it's incredibly disrespectful and invasive and insulting to have somebody say to you, well, you must be broken because you don't happen to desire the same things that I desire or take pleasure in the same things that I take pleasure in. Right? Um, like with all variations in sexual orientation, what we're coming to understand is that asexuality is not a lack or a dysfunction for people who identify that way. It's just a variation because after all, all of us feel asexual about many people, right? If you look around at a crowd of people, many of the people in the crowd will not be people who turn on your sexual attraction or who you feel sexually interested in, right? Um, so we all understand what it means to not feel sexual desire for somebody. And so we just need to accept that there are some people who feel that way about everyone. No one is their type. No one sets off their sexual desire. And it's, again, it's extremely disrespectful and frustrating to be told that your experienced desires or lack of desires are a sign of you being somehow broken or traumatized. I mean, think about it in terms of your own life, assuming that you're not asexual, perhaps some of you are, but if you're not asexual, try to think of a time where you haven't been sexually attracted to somebody, perhaps a friend of yours or something, and they've acted like, well, they just need to fix you, right? They need to, um, they need to help you get over whatever's wrong with you so that you can be sexually attracted to them. That's awful, right? You never want to be told that you're supposed to be sexually attracted to somebody that you're not sexually attracted to. So if you're not sexually attracted to anybody, you don't want the world telling you that you need to be fixed. It's undermining, not only is it invasive and disrespectful, but it's undermining of your autonomy, including your sexual autonomy, because sexual autonomy involves not just the ability to control your sex life, but the ability to control your lack of sex life without people telling you that the way that you're doing it is wrong. I think part of the reason we've had trouble um, understanding asexuality and the reason that it's been harder to stop pathologizing it and stop treating it as a defect is because for many of us, it's hard to accept that something that brings us so much pleasure and is so important to our sense of well-being isn't, um, that, that if somebody else is missing that, that it's not impoverishing, right? You, we feel like, well, it brings me so much pleasure, it's so important to me that if somebody else has none of that in their life, then their life must be impoverished in some ways. But remember, sex isn't special in this way. There's lots and lots of stuff just like this that many, many people love and find an enormous amount of fulfillment and meaning in, and other people are just not into it. And those other people's lives are just as rich without it because they're busy finding pleasure and meaning in other things. There's no one source of pleasure or source of meaning that we all have to share, right? So for example, I absolutely despise team sports and team sports fandom. It has zero appeal to me. I find it really off-putting, like literally zero interest. Um, for many people, watching sports and being a sports fan and being into team sports is completely central to their identity and sense of self. And it's one of their primary sources of pleasure, right? It gives them pleasure every weekend. It's what they like to do with their friends, whatever. Obviously, sports fandom is an enormously important sense of pleasure and identity for many people. But the fact that I don't have that pleasure doesn't mean that my life is impoverished. It just means that that's not one of the pleasures that happens to be for me. Conversely, the fact that I can get by without that pleasure and not be impoverished doesn't detract from the value or importance of that pleasure to other people or for its meaningfulness to their identity. We need to be able to hold on to those two thoughts at the same time, that something might be genuinely, importantly pleasurable and meaningful and identity driving for some people, and yet for the other people who don't have it, it might not be a deficiency or a lack, it might just be a variation, right? That's certainly true for sports fandom, and we're starting to get better about acknowledging that it's also true for sexuality that no matter how real and pressing and intense the importance and pleasure of sexuality is for many of us, that just simply doesn't mean that there's anything wrong or deficient about the people who don't partake in that pleasure. None of us can have all of the pleasures and all of the meanings. Their pleasures and meanings are just elsewhere.
And Todd comes to understand that about himself over the course of this episode. Right? At first, he does feel like there might be something wrong with him. But as the episode com goes on, he comes to embrace asexuality as a real part of his identity. And that raises the last question that I want to raise about this, which is, what makes it an identity? Right? Not every feature of us is an identity. So um, I don't know, whatever. Um, I have dark brown hair, but I don't consider it a matter of identity that I have dark brown hair. So which features of us are really identity features? Well, to, for something to be an identity is partly about its being central to your sense of self. And it really does come to be central to Todd's sense of who he is, that he's asexual. But I think one of the things that the show suggests to us in this episode, which seems to me deeply right, is that part of something being a full-fledged identity is that there's um, a community of people who have that identity that can share stories and share meanings and help articulate together what it is to have that identity. Right? Because the more he finds other asexuals and starts doing activities that are sort of, you know, labeled as asexual activities and talking to other asexual people about how they run their life, the more he understands himself, not just as having this weird quirk that he doesn't know what to say about, but as being a particular kind of person who has a particular social place and who can understand more about himself and what kind of person he is from talking to other people. And this is one of the reasons why community is really important, right? It helps us articulate the identities that we have and build them out and develop them into full into full identities. There's a really important insight here, I think, about the role of community and stories and social recognition in identity formation. Your understanding of what it is to be, let's say, what's a good identity? Um, what it is to be a student at the school that you're at. For most of you, that's Georgetown, but some of you enrolled in this class are at other schools, right? Those of you who are at Georgetown, presumably you have a Georgetown identity. It's part of your identity that you go to Georgetown. That doesn't just mean that you're registered here. It means that you have learned, partly through interacting with other Georgetown students, sort of what it means to be a Georgetown student. You've helped fill out and build out that part of your identity by getting recognition from others as a Georgetown student and having a community of other Georgetown students to build up that identity. And in that sense, I think the more that we recognize asexuality as an identity and the more the asexual community can build itself into a community, the more it will become a real identity because people can understand how to plant themselves in it. One thing that the um, article raises, which I think is an interesting question, is does asexual identity count as a queer identity? It's a sexual orientation, for sure, but it's the sexual orientation of being sexually oriented towards nobody. And they argue tentatively that in an important sense that is a queer identity because we might want to think of being queer as simply having a sexual orientation that doesn't fit with typical heterosexual expectations and norms, right? So you might think of a queer identity, a queer sexual orientation identity as being sexually attracted to people other than people of the opposite gender. And then in that sense, being asexual wouldn't make you queer because you're not sexually attracted to anybody. But they suggest that perhaps a more useful sense of queer identity is just having any sexual orientation that doesn't fit the standard heterosexual narrative and the standard heterosexual set of expectations. And in that sense, being asexual or ace is in fact a way of being queer. I find that fairly convincing. It's an interesting question. Last point about this, I like that the season distinguishes for us between being asexual and being aromantic in the um, asexual community. That's often um, described as the, the, the distinction between being ace and arrow, which is short for asexual and aromantic, because Sexuality and romance might feel to many of us who um, are used to operating this way, they may feel like they just go together, that when you feel romantic about somebody, you're sexually attracted to them, and when you're sexually attracted to somebody, it's because you want to have some kind of romantic relationship with them. But in fact, our desires for intimacy are much more complicated than that. And those two might track each other most of the time for a lot of people, but they don't have to. And you can feel romantically inclined towards somebody without being sexually attracted to them. And you can feel sexually attracted to somebody without being romantically inclined towards them. And so likewise, 
You might be somebody who just doesn't have sexual attractions, so you're asexual, but you still crave romantic intimacy and attractions, in which case you still seek romance. And then conversely, you might be somebody who's just, although you love having friends or whatever, other kinds of relationships are great, romantic intimacy is not something that you're interested in or understand or crave or want, in which case you're aromantic, and if you're aromantic, you might still be interested in sex. So you might be aromantic, but not asexual. So as Todd explains at one point, right, you can be any combination. You can be asexual, but want romance. You can be aromantic, but want sex, or you can want both, or you could be both asexual and aromantic. I think this is a nice point because it reminds us that there's lots of different kinds of intimacy and the show explores various different kinds of intimacy and you might want some kinds of intimacy and not others and those don't have to go together in the conventional way. There's no law that says that your desires for intimacy have to line up the way they do in traditional heterosexual stories. So Todd is asexual but he's not aromantic and I like the fact that we get to explore what intimacy means for him as he develops that identity. All right, I'll end season four lectures there.